On March 26th, I completed a true one tag world conquest in a bit over 28 years on patch 1.31.6, a world record. Some highlights of the run include becoming the Holy Roman Emperor and revoking the Privilegia by 1456, dealing with crazy amounts of aggressive expansion and overextension, obtaining military hegemon in 1461, creating a massive HRE incorporating most of Asia and Africa, spending a fortune maintaining way too many colonies, and ending with a boom. So how is this done? What tricks and exploits were used? What even is a true one tag? In this video, I'll summarize my run and answer all these questions. Let's start with some preliminary info. A world conquest is generally defined to be equivalent to the world conquer achievement, where every colonized province must be owned or subjugated by the player. Neither custom nations nor random new world are allowed under this interpretation. A one tag world conquest is a stricter variant where only colonial nation subjects are allowed. Finally, a true one tag world conquest is a further refinement, where no subjects of any form are allowed. All colonized provinces must be directly owned by the player. Speedruns are often understood as achieving particular objectives as quickly as possible according to either an externally measured clock or an internally measured clock. In EU4, the latter clock precisely corresponds to the in-game date, and using that metric seems to be more popular in the EU4 community. EU4 is a very unique game when it comes to the treatment of game time, since it is very normal to pause the clock to make many inputs. So there's definitely quite a departure between gameplays that optimize the real time and gameplays that optimize the in-game date. I spent about 287 hours on this run, averaging roughly 10 hours per in-game year. This perhaps makes this run simultaneously the fastest and the slowest world conquest when measured in two different ways. Now, let me explain the overall structure of this run and video. I'm dividing this run into three phases, becoming the Holy Roman Emperor and passing the Revoke the Privilege Reform, Afro-Eurasia Conquest, and finally Native Conquest. I'll finish with some general discussions, attributions, and teasers, so please, join me as I summarize what I believe is the most complicated and optimized E4 campaign that has ever been done. Phase 1 of the run spans the first 12 years, where my primary objective is to become the Holy Roman Emperor and revoke the Privilegia. Why is this such a high priority? Well, the reality is, conquest is extremely difficult and inefficient in the early game without stacking conquest-oriented modifiers such as CCR, Warscore cost, Siege ability, and so on. Therefore, securing an early revoke is the most productive way for me to expand my power base in the early game. Aside from revoking, I also focus on conquering prerequisites for missions and for future formations. In the early game, I am limited by the typical world conquest bottlenecks. I lack the army and economy to fight every neighbor at once, the CCR and unrest reduction to deal with overextension, and the siege ability to win wars quickly. Therefore, I place heavy emphasis on precise army micro. The mindset I have in this run is that I'm playing a turn-based game where each day is a turn. It's not too much of an exaggeration to say that I pause every single day to reevaluate my decisions. This precision in particular enables me to take my fairly limited resources and win many wars swiftly. I star as Oirat due to reasons we'll see over the course of this section. One very important reason that I'll point out now is that Oirat is a horde. This gives them Cassus Bellies on bordering nations and the ability to raise provinces, which converts conquered province development to monarch points. Hordes when played carefully are by far the best at snowballing, and therefore most speedruns naturally involve hordes. I restarted many times to start with high siege merc generals. Since I want to declare war on Korchin to the east and Chagatai to the west, I want at least one high siege stat merc on both sides. In my run, I had to start with two four siege generals, which I decided was a good enough start. After seizing Barag from my vassal Mongolia and building up troops on the eastern and western front, I declare war on Korchin. Here is the first major exploit which I call CTA Cancel. You can fizzle out automatic call to arms by declaring war on a nation 
and then immediately exiting the game at the right time, effectively making any war a 1 versus 1. This is very useful in the early game, when I don't have a strong army, but it also saves an immense amount of restarts since AI Alliance RNG is less relevant. There are a couple reasons I attack Korchun. The first is to raise Mongolia's opinion. The second is to conquer Korchun cultured provinces for the Unite the Mongols mission. And the third is so that I can expand east to eventually form Manchu. After declaring, I don't immediately move my troops. This is actually to let Korchun siege down a Mongol province. By unoccupying a Mongol province, I gain 25 opinion, helping me achieve the 190 opinion I need to begin Diplo annexing them. On 1445 September, I finished my first series of wars with Korchun and Chagatai. I use this moment of peace to begin Diplo annexing Mongolia and then start my next series of wars. 1446 April 16th marks the first of many instances of safe scumming for particular pulse events. Let's now talk about events. In E4, there are two types of events, mean time to happen and triggered. The former is a discretization of what is known in mathematics as medium time to happen, and every 20 days the game decides whether a nation should receive particular events or not. Triggered events are ones that are invoked by other parts of the game, such as from completing missions, enacting decisions, and so on. A subset of these triggered events are the pulse events. Periodically, these timed pulses trigger and select an event from a pool of events. While carrying out this run, we've discovered that both the precise dates of the MTTH and the pulse check are deterministic. In particular for Oirat on 1.31.6, 1446 April 16th is when the two-year pulse one triggers. So I safe scum and replay from a few days prior to get the military divided event, giving me 10% siege ability. This process is quite time consuming, and thankfully for my sanity, there are only a few pulse events actually worth safe scumming. The first of the many odd peace deals is against Solon, where I force feed most of Mongolia's provinces. One of the biggest bottlenecks to Oirat's mission tree is to own and core Ikure, which cannot be seized since it is their capital. It is therefore crucial for me to speed up the Diplo annexation process as much as possible, which I do here by lowering the total Diplo cost. Another benefit to this peace deal is that I gain revanchism, most importantly giving me manpower recovery and unrest reduction. Over the next few months, I seize the remaining Mongol provinces that I do not have cores on, finishing the integration on November 1446. My main objectives in these early wars are to focus on my mission tree and obtain high monarch point generation. For example, against Uzbek, I try to focus on Central Asian provinces but also focus on high raising efficiency provinces. The idea behind raising efficiency is to maximize the net monarch points gained from conquering the province, placing heavier emphasis on admin points. In particular, 222 dev provinces are by far the most raising efficient, allowing me to raise it to 111 and thus lowering the coring cost to the lowest possible value. On the other hand, provinces such as 111 or 444 are not too attractive, since in the former I can't even raise, and in the latter I still have to core a massive 9 development province after raising. Concentrate Dev also plays a vital role in raising efficiency, since I can use it to remove more development from newly conquered provinces. By the end of 1447, I'm already expanding towards Donghai on the east, all the way to Great Horde on the west. My economy tab doesn't show promising numbers due to my army maintenance from going way over force limit, but bear in mind that I'm constantly demanding money for my war enemies, so this is all okay. At this point, let me explain why I'm not getting coalitioned. You see, nations cannot perform diplomatic interactions with nations whose capital they cannot see, including joining coalitions. At game start, only Nomad and Chinese tech nations see Oirat's capital, so this effectively makes Oirat immune to be coalitioned by other tags. Nations discover your capital during war and after clicking on a province you own. A player can of course click on any owned province to reveal capitals, but AIs only seem to click bordering provinces, so as long as I don't border them, they will not discover me. One potential question you may have is why I have not declared on Ming yet. The community wisdom seems to be that Oirat should declare on Ming as soon as possible, which is wrong in the context of optimized gameplay. You see, Oirat's Tomb of Crisis event chain gives a massive 25% siege ability bonus until the death of the current ruler, who starts quite old. So I want to let my ruler Essen Taishi die to obtain a young ruler before triggering the event chain. 
Essentaishi's early death is perhaps the second most frustrating part of this entire run. Guess the most frustrating, I'll rant about it later. On 1448, I realized that I just cannot afford to wait any longer to fight Ming, so I constantly replayed a month or so during February to March until my ruler died, giving me a new ruler. There's some additional quirks about this ruler. He's of Timur Dynasty and has the Conquer trait. Something not well known is that dynasty spread does occur to non-Christian religions, so indeed, dying without an heir while having a royal marriage with the Timurids gives me a Timur Dynasty ruler. This step is necessary to form Timurids later, since the formation requires the ruler to be of Timur Dynasty. The Conquer trait isn't really for the separatism reduction. Rebels will spawn no matter what. Its purpose is that it makes me eligible for a pulse event, Fear and Awe, which gives me 15% siege ability. After all this, I finally declare on Ming, and of course, some other nations as well. On 1449 February, I get Admin Tech 5, which unlocks an idea group. It's utterly crucial that I unlock my idea group slot before 1449 October 3rd, which is when the 5 year pulse 1, or the idea group events, trigger. For my first idea group, I pick Horde Ideas to trigger Blue Dragon from 5 year pulse 1. This alongside Return to the Old Ways from 5 year pulse 2 allows me to obtain 33 monarch points per raised development, which in hindsight was overkill. I then select Diplo Ideas to get 20% war score cost reduction before piecing out Muscovy. Here I've been using a technique called Dip Banking. Since you get a full refund if you cancel ongoing culture conversions before they reach 10% progress, the idea is to start and cancel conversions to store dip points beyond the point cap. On 1450 April, I complete Defeat the Rus, the most important mission. Combined with Diplo ideas, I have 35% war score cost reduction now, and you can see the effects of this war score cost stacking immediately with me being able to full annex Novgorod in one war. Next up is my seemingly odd peace deal with Ming. The naive approach to the Ming War is to take as much land as possible. However, I only take a few provinces for future missions and Ming banking. Here's the idea of Ming banking. I mothball their boarding forts and queue movement orders such that an army arrives to each fort in a synchronized manner. I then peace out Ming right before my units arrive to the mothballed forts, and then immediately declare war on a Ming tributary. This immediately calls in Ming and therefore allows my units to siege back the four mothballed forts before they recover any garrison. A fort under 100 garrison always falls on the first siege tick, so the idea is to use this easy source of war score to piece Ming out for max ducats and then repeat for other tributaries. Since the amount of money you can demand in peace deals is linear to enemy development, it's actually counterproductive to take provinces from Ming. Sadly, on 1.31.6, AIs do not accept call to arms of bankrupt, making this no longer the overpowered money printer that used to be in prior patches. That being said, I can still use this to obtain around 10k ducats before Ming goes bankrupt, which is a lot at this point in the game. Aggressive Ming banking allows me to go even more above my force limit. For example, by 1451 November, I have 124 regiments, many of them being mercs. Let me also highlight the fact that I released 3 OPM vassals from Lithuania, which will be crucial for the revoke later. On 1451 December, I piece out Poland, Teutonic Order, and Livonian Order, which gives me enough Catholic development to change my state religion. After conquering the provinces, I meticulously add and remove European Christian provinces to trade company. I'll go back to the significance of this in 5 years when I revoke. To ensure Theodoro has high opinion of me, I annex and release them. I then diplomatically tributarize them to obtain maps of North and South Germany. Setting up tributaries of various tech groups to discover regions is a recurring technique I use, since manual exploration by conquistadores is extremely time consuming. You might be surprised that electors have no AE on me despite me conquering most of Eastern Europe. Well. Here's another quirk about Terra Incognita. Nations who you do not see do not get AE on your conquests, so I made sure to sign all my peace deals with Christians before I obtained maps of North and South Germany. Any Christian conquests at this stage will incur significant AE problems. I peace everyone out by August 1452, and let's look at our borders. Wow, we've expanded quite a bit. At this point, I put a pause to my conquests. The reason is twofold. I want to be elected as the Holy Roman Emperor, so I need high relations on the electors but also high Diplo reputation. Conquering Christians will incur enough AE to jeopardize my vote with the HRE electors, and conquering provinces in general gives me overextension and therefore lowers my Diplo reputation.
Keep in mind that Quarren Provinces with my current setup takes 28 months, so I really do need to take a breather here. Next, I get elected by simply safe scumming until Austria's ruler dies. Hordes do count as monarchies as far as the HRE system is concerned, so there's no need for clever government tricks. I should mention that the traditional method involves forced tributarizing Austria to trigger an HRE election. Sadly, my country was not prepared for a quick war against Austria due to poor army positioning, so I had to resort to this admittedly lame brute force method. My primary focus until 1456 November is on stacking Diplo reputation to pass HRE reforms through a state agenda, missions, and some events. Now that we're the Emperor, let's talk about the HRE. The Emperor can enact reforms using Imperial Authority, and by progressing towards the penultimate reform of the Centralization Tree, Revoke the Privilegia, the Emperor will vassalize all HRE members that accept the reform. This is colloquially known as Revoking, and historically, there have been clever strategies to rapidly farm Imperial Authority to rush through the reforms. Here, I'm employing the so-called Lambda Revoke. This is a fast revoke strategy that I discovered on 1.30, and over the years, I found some improvements to the strategy. Let's start with some preliminary info. First, you gain 5 base Imperial Authority when someone, including the Emperor, joins the HRE via the HRE interface. Two. If you keep your capital isolated from potential HRE provinces, your capital will not be added to HRE when joining. And three, you can click the Join HRE button if your capital is not in the HRE and you have an eligible province, which is loosely speaking a European non-TC Christian core that is adjacent to an HRE province, but not in the HRE. For presentation purposes, let me first introduce a simpler variant of the revoke strategy. Let's call it the Visa Revoke. I begin by isolating my capital by surrounding with a non-HRE vassal. This will ensure that I don't actually join the HRE, since doing so will prevent me from clicking the Join HRE button. I then use the Trade Node interface to add everything in the node to TC, which forces all the added provinces to exit the HRE. Next, I take one of the freshly TC'd provinces that borders the HRE and remove it from TC, and voila, I created an eligible province. I can now click Join HRE. That's 5 Imperial Authority per Trade Node. Not great, but we're getting somewhere. Next up is my initial proposal, the V1 Revoke. For a given trade node, I statify every state but one and then add to TC using the trade node interface. Only territories get added to TC, so by stating everything else, I ensure that only one state is added to TC at a time. I then remove from TC, join HRE, and that's 5 Imperial Authority. I then pick a state in the node and unstate it. I can add to TC again since it wasn't added in the previous step. That's another 5 Imperial Authority. All in all, the V1 Revoke gives 5 Imperial Authority per unique state. Pretty nice. Okay, let's skip ahead to the V3 Revoke. This one requires prep work. Let's add every province in the node to TC. I then remove a province from TC, wait a day, remove another province from TC, and so on. One province per day. Fast forward 5 years, actually slightly less due to some paradox math that I don't understand. I enabled pop-up and pause for when the temporary promise modifier expires, which is very useful here. The first promise that I removed from TC 5 years ago no longer has the left trade company debuff, so I can use the trade node interface to add to HRE, that's 5 Imperial Authority. Note that no other promise were added to TC because they all still have the left trade company debuff. Let one day pass, and the next province is available to join TC. Another 5 Imperial Authority, and so on. That's 5 Imperial Authority per province. And this strategy answers why I added and removed most of Eastern Europe to TC roughly 5 years ago. It was all in preparation for this moment. The V2 Revoke is an orthogonal variation. The key insight is that province transfer gets rid of the left trade company debuff. So in this strategy, I add a province to TC, allowing me to join HRE, accept Separatist demands to lose the province to one of my vassals, seize it back, add to TC, and so on as long as my vassal's liberty desire remains below 50. This is the reason for me releasing the three vassals earlier. Ever since I released them, I've been farming Liberty Desire Reduction on these subjects through paying off debt which I forced by giving four occupation during war, placating them, and developing their provinces. All in all, this gives 5 Imperial Authority per 15 Liberty Desire, assuming the province I transfer is a 3 development province. The full theory behind the revoke is quite complicated, and therefore I'll defer to my previous videos where I fully explain the mechanics at play. Link in description. 
But I hope I gave enough info to convince you that this is indeed possible. By combining the aforementioned V2 and V3 revokes, I finished the revoke on 1456 November 16th. If someone told me it's possible to revoke in 1456 as Oirat on 1.31, I would have been skeptical, but accepted it as a possibility. However, if someone told me they can go from this to this all in 12 years, well, let's just say I would require VODs. But that's what I precisely did in this run, and in this section, you'll understand how this expansion rate was possible. As a preliminary, I must explain how powerful the HRE is. The obvious bit is that it gives a crazy amount of force limit, money, and manpower, all crucial resources for fighting wars against everyone. One of the reforms give 10% CCR, which is certainly useful. The most interesting and perhaps obscure bit though is that when clicking join HRE, all provinces connected by land to an eligible province join the HRE, which includes most of Africa and Asia. This gives rise to a very interesting and overpowered gameplay loop, where I conquer as many provinces as possible in a contiguous manner, join HRE to add them to HRE, and then release HRE vassals everywhere. Keep in mind that I'll inherit all HRE vassals upon enacting the final HRE reform. In short, the following 12 years consist of me engaging in a series of so-called total wars. I declare on a massive amount of countries, piece all the nations out in a short time window, add everything I conquered to HRE, and then release most of them as vassals. In particular, there are four total wars, with intermediate peacetime being used to form additional nations, release new HRE vassals, and setting up new expansion paths. During my first total war, I obtained two very important pulse events, Unjust War and Defender of the Vulnerable Faith. Unjust War requires my ruler to have the Silver Tongue trait, and Defender of the Vulnerable Faith, loosely speaking, requires me to be the Defender of the Faith of a small religion. I converted to Shia by abusing the Adopt Islam as State Religion decision, which is coded in a funky manner. It requires the country's capital to be some Muslim religion, and the country to have any Muslim dominance. Upon enacting the decision, the country adopts the state religion of the capital. In my case, I had Sunni dominance, but my capital was Shia, so even though I had very little Shia development, the decision still converted me to Shia. In total, I achieved 70% war score reduction, allowing pretty crazy peace deals against big nations like France, Ottomans, Karakoyunlu, and Timurids. If you think this is crazy, just to wait until the later Total Wars where I stack way more. After piecing the major nations out, I encounter a recurring bottleneck, diplomats. I don't want to wait months waiting for my diplomats to come back, since that not only slows my pacing, but also forces me to sit on a bunch of uncored provinces, causing overextension, and eventually rebels. The solution is to ditch Diplo ideas, which removes the two diplomats from that idea group. If I reenact the first Diplo idea to gain a new diplomat, I immediately get a free diplomat which I can use to sign a peace deal. Therefore, I simply repeat the process of removing and enacting the first Diplo idea to spawn free diplomats so that I can peace out all these wars as soon as possible. Diplo points that I banked can be used for this, but I can also gain Diplo points on the fly by raising provinces that I conquered. While raising, I will eventually hit admin and mill point caps, and I don't want to waste precious points. For admin, I simply start coring provinces that I conquered. Similar to culture conversion, cancelling ongoing cores below 10% progress will fully refund the points. This is a nice temporary way to bank admin points. Unfortunately, there's no nice way to bank mill points, so I spam recruit generals until I hit 100 professionalism, but focus on raising provinces with one mill dev so that I don't gain too much mill. All in all, I amassed over 2000 OE at the end. So now the question is, what do I do with all the monarch points that are raisable? For dip, I can perpetually bank it. For admin, I can temporarily bank it. I can't sit on the overextension forever, but it'll be fine for a month or two. For mill, well, I hope you're ready. I first enact the first two ideas of quantity. I then take all my stored professionalism and then slack in recruitment standards. Each click gives two years worth of manpower at the cost of five professionalism. So I want to temporarily maximize my manpower recovery, which is why I took quantity. I also set increased enlistment edict on every state, 
which made each slackening give around 72,000 manpower. I now spam raise provinces, banking admin and dip as I discussed earlier, and using freshly obtained mill points to spam more generals to raise my professionalism again. All in all, I slackened 24 times, corresponding to 120 professionalism, all of which I farmed through recruiting generals from excessive mill points from raising. And now I have 1.7 million manpower. For admin, I ditch quantity and enact the first two admin ideas, giving me more CCR. At this point, I have a total of 55% CCR, which importantly multiplicatively reduces coring time to 16 months. There are many provinces that I would like to keep for later formations, missions, and so on, so I want to core those instead of releasing as vassals. But life isn't simple. Overextension gives unrest and corruption, so I want to minimize my coring time. And for that, I use the fact that provinces of my culture group core twice as fast. For example, to core all the Persian cultured provinces, I change my primary culture to Mazandarani, which makes the base coring time 8 months. Since I have permanent claims on Persia through missions, the coring duration goes down by another 10%, giving me 7 month coring. Yes, permanent claims reduce cost additively by 25%, but they only reduce time multiplicatively by 10% as if they are normal claims. Note that not all provinces that I want to core are nice like that. For example, I can't core French cultured provinces quickly, since I can't state any French cultured provinces to change my primary culture. So I just have to deal with those. After all that, I ditch admin and move on to Inno ideas. Yep, we're going Inno. It does have a couple interesting benefits here though. So for one, I gain an innovativeness modifier, so I just get more innovativeness filling it out more than any other idea group. And two, it has a 10% admin tech cost pulse event. And three, it has 10% tech cost and another 14% admin tech cost by virtue of it being an admin idea group. My long-term viewers though won't allow me to paint Inno in a positive light. So Inno bad, 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 Inno bad. All of this and using various events to stack admin tech cost reduction allowed me to achieve tech 7 in 1460, unlocking another idea group. Once that's over, I can ditch Inno and go back to Diplo ideas. I also take Explo ideas so I can start aggressively exploring. Requesting maps from tributaries works great, but for the Americas, I have to discover the coast myself. I then declare a few wars here and there, but I don't start a total war because I want to form Timurids once my Persian cores are finished. One odd piece deal is me intentionally losing to Karaman, which gives me more revanchism to work with. After my cores are finished, I form Timurids, charter trade company to set up footholds, and then start the next series of wars. During the second total war, I build over 1,000 total regiments and obtain military hegemon, which gives 10% war score reduction. I now have 80% total, so this roughly means that I can full annex nations that are normally 500% war score. By the way, I haven't covered the actual wars themselves so far, so here's a sample clip. I found it difficult to explain the theory of fighting wars optimally in a concise manner, so I'm going to gloss over this part. It may be a topic for a future video in case there's enough interest, but future me will deal with that problem. I'll still mention a few high level points though. Contrary to popular belief, the vassal swarm from HRE is not helpful for winning wars, since AIs are bad at the game. I fight all my wars. Next, I make heavy use of the game's messaging system. For example, I enable pop up and pause on unit arrival, after occupying a province, and so on. This forces me to keep track of way more things in parallel than I would normally be able to. My siege ability is quite high from various events, missions, and professionalism, so forts fall very quickly even though I don't have cannons yet. And in a similar spirit, I have a significant army quality advantage over my enemies through army tradition, power projection, mission rewards, and so on, so I can win fights very easily despite not taking any military ideas. I conquer Brittany, Castile, Aragon, Hungary, Anatolia, Chagatai, and most of Scandinavia, Arabia, Mamluks, India, and Indochina, ending at a bit below 4000 OE. As per last time, I core things that I need for later formables and missions and then offload the rest to fresh HRE vassals. After forming Golden Horde, I adopt its national ideas for 25% CCR and click its missions. I then form Siam, again for the missions, and then finally Bavaria. 
My base CCR at this point is 70%. 25% from National Ideas, 10% from HRE, 20% from Timur admissions, and 15% from Bavaria missions. The latter half are temporary modifiers, but as far as this speedrun is concerned, they last until the end of the game. Once I take Admin 2 on top of this for an additional 25% CCR, I can get the minimum coring time of 6 months for any province that I want to core, which as I've stressed alleviates corruption gain from OE, but also comfortably lets me ignore the unrest from OE. This is because rebel factions only progress at most by 10% each month, so assuming all factions are at 0% progress before I sign the peace deals, I will be done with coring the provinces before any rebel factions tick up to 100% progress. After chartering some provinces as footholds, I begin my third total war. I conquer Portugal, North Africa, West Africa, half of Japan, some straggling nations in Arabia and India, and grab some footholds in South America. I fully revealed South America by asking for maps from my tributary Potiguara, and again, I rarely bother with exploring inland through conquistadors since they take too long. I also capped envoy travel time from the Petra Monument, Explo 5, Influence 6, and an Influence Idea Group Pulse event. This essentially gives jetpacks to my diplomats, allowing them to return from any nation after a single day. I therefore no longer refresh diplo ideas all the time in sending out these mass peace deals, which means I can also increase the number of nations that I declare on in the total wars compared to the previous ones. Also, by sending a colonist to Tuat, I can connect Western Africa to Europe, allowing me to add everything there to the HRE. In the interest of organization for this video, I'm going to tackle the entire theory of native conquest as a separate section. You should however keep in mind that I've technically begun my native conquest around this point by obtaining small footholds here and there, while aggressively obtaining maps. In my fourth and final total war, I conquer Poland, Lithuania, the British Isles, Burgundy, Ming, Japan, East Indies, most of mainland Africa, and again a bit of South America. Similar to how I dealt with West Africa, I can send a colonist to Rukwa to connect Congo and Central Africa to Europe for HRE purposes. Many nations cannot be formed as a horde, which is why the number of formations I've done so far have been quite tame. To get around this, I formed Jerusalem, which makes me a monarchy. As a fun fact, forming Jerusalem with Mongol primary culture gives Mongol missions, which if you remember I didn't fully complete before forming Machu. I then form a bunch of other non-horde tags, many of them honestly being for fun. Two mildly important formables are Morocco and Tunis, which both give movement speed. After collecting all the modifiers and having some fun, I form Yuan and then Mongol Empire, which brings me back to a horde. I spend a few more months cleaning up some minor tags like France and Muscovy. Due to pulse event timings, I wanted to stay Mongol Empire until 1468 November. Anyway, what remains is most of the New World, Oceania, Madagascar, and other small nations that I haven't gone around to annexing. Since my economy is about to tank, I took out all available loans in preparation for the final segment. Finally, on December 1468, I reap the rewards of my meticulous management of the HRE. Please enjoy. At this point, we're going to shift our focus to conquering the natives. First, I should clarify that natives refer to nations with the native government type. The Nahuatl, Mayan, and Inti nations are therefore not natives under this definition. Conquering those guys are easy. Similarly, conquering places like Madagascar or Hawaii does not involve anything special, so I won't mention these easy to annex nations in this section. Instead I'll focus on the natives in the Americas and Australia. Conquering the natives have always been a tough part of one-tag world conquest speedruns. It truly is a unique experience since they play by different rules compared to normal nations. 
Before I explain further, let me give a brief rundown of how natives work on 1.31.6. Well, let me be honest, they do not work. There are tons of features that I can only imagine are bugs or unintended. When you conquer an OPM native's capital, they migrate to some adjacent province. This fact makes the final annexations very frustrating since in many cases they cannot be full annexed. There are two solutions to this madness, ensuring the native has nowhere to migrate to, or by making them a non-OPM. The former can be achieved, for example, by starting colonies to fully surround the native, or continuously conquering the native and chasing them down through truce breaks. The latter can be achieved by selling a province to them. This means that in the worst case, all natives can be conquered in two wars. One war to take a province that I promptly sell back, making them no longer OPMs, and then another war to full annex them. Therefore, my final setup is to enact Explo and Expansion for three colonists to aid in trapping the natives. I still have Envoy travel time capped through Petra, Explo 5, and two Pulse events from Influence and Trade Ideas, so diplomats are still very quick. Unfortunately, colonist travel time does not go down all the way to one day like for diplomats. They seem to only go down to roughly 10% of the original travel time, so I moved my capital to Gibraltar, a Sunni province that is close to the Americas. Hold on, why didn't I move my capital to, say, Mexico? It certainly gives faster colonist travel time in the Americas. This is due to a stability farming technique which I've been using sparingly in the run to enable truce breaking. You see, the Adopt Islam as State Religion decision that I talked about earlier gives one stability, so if I repeatedly flip out of Sunni and then back to Sunni using the decision, I can farm stability. In my case, I flip between Catholic and Sunni. Since converting to Catholic via Zealots requires Catholic plurality, and using the decision requires Sunni plurality, I ensure that Catholic and Sunni development are my two biggest religions by development and only one development apart. Thus, I can adjust which religion is the dominant one by either developing or exploiting appropriate provinces to repeatedly flip between the two religions. Since I've been full annexing most nations in one war due to war score cost stacking, I rarely had to declare wars causing stab hits. However, I will be no CBing and truce breaking a lot in this section. So this setup is very important. And this is why I did not move my capital to the Americas. It is not a trade company region, so the Adopt Islam decision is not available. I declare on all the natives and piece them out on 1470 January. This part is quick because I can use co-belligerent chains to declare on all the natives in just a few wars. As for the peace deals themselves, I generally try to full annex natives if I can trap them, which is often the case in dense areas. For the ones who I cannot trap, I still take a province so that I can promptly sell it back to them to make them non-OPMs. Now I just have to truce break everyone again and I'm done. Oh no! Oh no! Actually, natives can decolonize provinces you give them when they adopt certain government reforms, which unfortunately happened to coincide with 1470 February. Very unlucky. Okay, let me try again, except I'll wait until February before selling land this time. Here's what the map looks like at this point. I still have many months to go since there are many tags left to declare war on, and I can only declare one war per month. I can't use co-belligerent chains like last time since I have truces with everyone. Why is this one war per month restriction even a thing? Why are there so many new world tags? The world will never know. After finishing all the natives, I declare on other straggling nations. Note that I'm refusing to core provinces in colonial areas to prevent colonial nations from forming. That's one way to do a true one tag. This does mean I'm swarmed by rebels from the overextension, but that does not matter. Separatists enforce their demands after 5 years of continuous occupation, and I know I'll finish the run before that happens. Nations also cannot break to rebels if they're at war, so I cannot break to rebels either. At least until I let one month tick pass after piecing out my wars. Last four of the run falls, and okay, I clearly need to take the money there. 
I finished the run on 1472 December 27th. A world conquest in 28 years. That's a world record. Don't mind me getting to 100 mercantilism for absolutely no reason. And here's the moment, the prettiest E4 firework you will ever see. If you're satisfied with Ming exploding, well get ready for the world exploding. Ready? There you have it. If you're interested in more lore, please stick around for my parting words. Ever since I discovered how abusable the HRE was on 1.30, I've predicted a world conquest by 1510 to be possible. Aside from Marco's 1485 run on 1.21, the fastest known world conquest at that point was my 1531 run on 1.29, so any optimizations beyond 1531 were very welcome. I moved this estimate down to 1500 when I learned about the Defender of the Vulnerable Faith event from the Chinese community. Personally, I felt that it was not a very satisfying event to plan around, since getting it requires many save scums or insanely good RNG. With 1.32 release coming where they fixed a large chunk of HRE, I figured that my prior brainstorming will never see the light of the day. Then Terry dropped a 1495 World Conquest out of nowhere with a similar strategy. HRE revoke, add Asia and Africa to HRE, and stack war score reduction, in particular by save scumming for the Defender of the Vulnerable Faith event. This new source of competition gave me the burst of motivation I needed to carry out the run I've been planning since 1.30, and I initially put my estimates at 1490 due to new innovations and tools I had, for example CTA cancel. All tricks, exploits, and save scums were fair game in my mind at this point. As I moved further and further into the run and discovered additional strategies, the goal shifted to 1485, then 1480, and finally 1472. Given that at that time, my prediction for a near optimal time was around 60 years, I'm astonished to have gone a world conquest in 28 years. I optimized by over a factor of 2. The run as painful as it was, was a great learning experience for me, and in my opinion shows the absurdity that one can take you for by stacking modifiers and re-rolling for good RNG. There's a part of me that thinks that this record will remain for the rest of E4's game cycle. 1.31 was truly a golden era for fast world conquest, with a lot of mechanics and exploits aligning. I'm not sure if such a miraculous combination will happen in any future patches. Uh, yes, this run can be improved by small amounts here and there, I guess, but I think I've loosely presented a near optimal time in the sense of the amount of effort a person is willing to put in. I spent probably 500 or so hours in this run, if you include playtime and theory crafting time, so this run is my magnum opus, if you will. And yes, for you classical lovers out there, my use of Brahms' first symphony is intentional. He spent 21 years composing this masterpiece under great pressure, because some viewed him as a successor to Beethoven. It's certainly an exaggeration for me to compare my mere half year of work to this symphony, but I truly feel that there's an analogy to draw between the excruciating amount of time and effort behind this masterpiece and my run. Thank you, Brahms. There are way too many attributions that I want to make. First, I want to thank all members of the community who supported me in this run by cheering me on in Twitch chat, YouTube, Reddit, etc. You know who you are. In particular, I especially appreciate people who gave crucial feedback and guidance on earlier drafts of this video. Again, you know who you are. Next, I want to give special recognition for people who helped develop some key strategies used in the run. Gnostic came up with Ming Banking, and the idea to force feed Mongolia to Solon for faster diplo annexation. He's also just an insane horde player and was a great source of friendly competition. I learned about the CTA cancel trick from the Chinese community. I believe it is a credit to a person named CT. Bast helped in developing the foundations of the fast revoke. Dumb idiot and grow the class investigated and discovered how pulse events work, allowing me to know when I need to save scum for certain events. M Sparta helped a lot in searching for pulse events of interest. Short suggested the idea of the infinite stab strategy. Speaking of the stab strategy, Komagusi, developer of pdx.tools, provided me with a lot of quality of life tools, most notably being the ability to compute development by religion, which helped me set up big endgame religion flipping. 
You can actually check out my save file in this website, and also analyze your own save files, link in description. And last but not least, Terry. He came up with the native conquest strategy of selling provinces, and piloted the Bavaria formation. Terry also seems to have independently discovered the V3 revoke, which he dubbed the Lambda Plus revoke. I'm flattered at the naming by the way. And of course, as mentioned, his monumental 1495 run is what motivated me to follow through on this run. Without it, this run would have joined the category of interesting runs that I've theorycrafted that I'll never do. I have many of those, by the way. Any questions or stats that you wish were shown? Feel free to leave a comment. I may or may not do a follow-up Q&A video if I find enough interesting questions that are worth discussing. If you made it here, I truly appreciate your time. I sincerely hope that I was able to provide an enjoyable summary of my run. Given that my run was extremely complex, arguably the most complicated run ever done in E4, I had to strike the right balance between being precise and being verbose.